Everybody loves the Lord. Say amen. amen. You're a beautiful crowd. Turn to 24 in your hymn book. And let's sing I am thine, O Lord. Okay? Number 24 in your hymn book. Amen. Stand with me, everybody, now. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice.
done too much for me? Amen. Sing it again. I'll never forsake it. I'll never forsake it. testify this morning real quickly. You remain standing and the rest of you be seated. Amen. All right? Amen. Is that fair enough? All right. Now we have several. Just, just praise the Lord here. Go ahead, John. Amen. Amen. because I'm his and he's mine. I learned to trust him a long time ago and I mean to make heaven my home. I love the Lord today. It's good to say that he saves and sanctifies me right now. And I also know that not only has the Lord been moved, but the devil's upset and angry. I went out with the teens last night and didn't make it. Car overheated. The devil tried to get me upset. And I just said, praise the Lord. And when I got back, I had a prayer meeting about the car. And it's okay. Amen. The devil, we're up on the mountaintop. And the devil can't get up there. He's going to try to drag us down into the valley. But he can't get to the mountaintop. The Lord's up there. I just thank the Lord this morning for being such a great and mighty God. And I just realize that sometimes the power of Satan looks so strong, but outside of God's power is just nothing at all. And I'm so thankful that even when he's there to bother you and pester you and do all of those things, that's the most important time to just say praise the Lord. I mean, he is that great this morning. Amen. It's good to be back at camp again. Across the years, God's been so wonderful. Can remember when we didn't have this much in the shed. God was so present, rejoicing the heart, not knowing as that same God today, that God that will continue on and keep us sweet and sound Amen. as we give him opportunity. Been praying for this camp meeting like others. And I know God will not disappoint me and others. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anyone else real quick? Oh, Johnny. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. She loves the Lord, then. Bless your heart.
Amen. Bobby really loves the Lord. Amen. God bless you, Bobby. Great to be in camp meeting, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's stand together for prayer. And uh, Brother Steve Stevenson, our pastor at Baton Rouge First Church, he and his wife Shirley make such a great addition to our district, ministerial family, and we're so proud of them and love them. Steve's going to come and lead us in prayer. And I just wonder how many of you have a special request. Just slip your hand up and just kind of look around and see those with needs, those with special requests. You'll know better how to pray. Amen. God bless you. Steve, come and Yes, Grandma. Amen. Amen. That's a, that's the thing to do. Keep praying for them, for our grandchildren. Amen. She's got one she thinks been called to preach and uh, just needs to get everything right with God. Amen. Brother Stevenson, come and lead us in prayer. Two verses of Scripture I'd like to share with you before we pray. The Lord told us, he said, if you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. John 14, 14. Also, we read in, in Luke 1, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. The devil's probably told you it's all right, everybody else can get blessed, and God will answer their prayer, but you're not going to receive anything anyway. But it's by faith. So this morning as we pray, let's say, Lord, this is my day, this is my time, this is my service, and claim it by faith. We're glad this morning, our Heavenly Father, for the privilege to be in camp meeting. Amen. We thank God that you've been here all week with us, Lord. We've not been disappointed. We've not been disillusioned. The preaching of the Word has been great, Lord, because you have come to anoint your servant right. and to bless them. From the, every service, Lord, has been touched by God, and we just rejoice in it. We were reading, Lord, and remember from the Old Testament how you came down and you met with Moses there in the tabernacle of old, Lord. And though sometimes we think because the old tabernacle doesn't look like much that God wouldn't come. But, Lord, we remember that you fill that place with your great glory, Lord. Oh, God, the people standing by observed that God was there. <laughs> The glory of the Lord fill that place, and you're here this morning, Lord. Fill our heart and mind with thy great glory, Lord. We're a needy people. We need thee to come, O oh Lord. We need thee to anoint. We need you to bless. We need thee to uplift and to inspire and to answer prayer. This one, Lord, that has indicated they're praying and believing, O oh Lord, for the needs of a loved one today. God is a great God that's able to reach down and touch, Lord, that precious one and help them to answer the call to the ministry of that is our desire for their lives, Lord. We're so glad our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We think about this one that's crippled this morning, Lord, unable to talk plainly, but Lord, thou dost hear the groanings of her heart. You know the desire of her soul. We look forward to that day. Oh, God. <laughs> when she steps on the streets of gold, Lord, and marches up and down the hills of God, shouting the praise of the Lord, we want to be in on that great time together. It's going to be a glorious time. We pray this morning you'll anoint our speaker of the hour. Make it easy for Brother Quinn to preach, Lord. Oh, God, just so surround him and fill him with your love. Lord, that the words will flow from his heart, set aflame by the divine fullness of the blessed Holy Ghost. Bless our musicians and singers, Lord. Thank God for them. You know the need, Lord, that they have the old devil's battling. Touch them in body and in spirit. Make it easy for them to sing. And, Lord, touch our hearts and minds. Touch our ears and our hearts, oh, Lord. Lord, and this morning when the word's lifted, give us a shout of praise and a heart unto God for the great forgiveness of our sins, Lord, and for the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and for all that you do, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. I believe God's here this morning. And I should have told you before the prayer, but Ginger is ill this morning. They the flu, a virus kind of been going through the family. And Kip's had it, and he's unselfish, gave it to his brother. And uh, brother didn't want it, gave it to his mother. And, 
It's just like the restaurant, everything everybody doesn't want, they give to Wally. He'll end up with it when it's over and over with. But she's very sick this morning, and let's remember Ginger as we pray in, in our prayers today. Uh, I do need to get a count for those that are going to uh, be eating with us in the dining hall. And uh, JT, if you'd count that side, and uh, Herb, if you'd count this area over here. Uh, would you just stand if you're going to be eating with us at lunch in the dining hall? And would you stand, please, and they'll get a count and uh, know about uh, what's to be expected. <coughs> Wally and Ginger say that on the Louisiana District Camp, we have some of the best camp food to be found anywhere on any of the camps. Also said we had one of the best dining halls to be found anywhere. And we're proud of that and proud of the food. 56 over there, and how much? 56 and 18, that's something like 74. And uh, see, you noticed how fast I did that, didn't you? <laughs> Amen. Doc, would you go down and tell the cooks we counted? Oh, they're getting, okay, they can hear us. Well, if they can hear us, we just want you to know down there in the kitchen how nice we think you folks are. Uh, y'all are doing such a great job, and we love you, and Everett, will you quit laughing? I see you laughing over there. <laughs> uh, we know Beverly's the one behind the throne down there, and we thank her for all she's doing. <laughs> They're doing a super job, and we love and appreciate them. This is Sam Day on the Louisiana District Campground, and many of you have already come in. And Brother Isbell will be here in just, just shortly. He wasn't sure he'd get back in time for this service today. The Sam Banquet is at nine, is at five o'clock this evening. Dr. Dean Wessels will be our special speaker and, uh, I've already talked to him today on the telephone and he'll be here in plenty of time and is looking forward to it. And, and we're just looking forward to a great day in the Lord. There will be a, a meeting of the District Board of Christian Life this afternoon at 1.30. Uh, the uh, Sam Banquet at 5, and uh, and then, of course, our choir practice at 7, and the evening service at 7.30 tonight. And God has been blessing. How many were in the service last night? Lift your hands. Wasn't that a marvelous service? Yeah. Oh, God came, and shouts of victory in the camp rang out and resounded across the campgrounds. And God came in such a wonderful, wonderful, marvelous way during the singing of the songs, the hymns, and the specials by Wally and Ginger and the choir. God just moved in in a special way. And what a grand time we had. Uh, Bobby Jones came to me this morning and said, Oh, Brother West, I just want to tell you. I said, You notice the little girls right down there? Yeah, she knelt right over there. I said, uh, She's a Catholic. I said, That's the first time she's ever been converted in all of her life. And said, She really prayed through and said just in a marvelous way. And there was a young man knelt down on that end of the altar, soldier from Fort Polk, uh, raised in a Nazarene church up north somewhere. But he said, I've never been around anything like this before. I said, People are kind of quiet and reserved where I came from. He said, I believe I've been quenching the Spirit. And he just prayed and sought God down there. God moved in a wonderful way. We're having camp meeting this week because of God's presence. And I'll tell you the reason. I was here at the early morning prayer meeting this morning. Billy Jordan's had charge of them and doing a wonderful job as our prayer leader during the camp. Uh, but I'll tell you the altar was just about lined from end to end, some on both sides with people praying, and God was here. And as I knelt down there and prayed, I said, God, this is the reason. Here's the power Right here, here's the power. And though I haven't been in all the prayer meetings, Brother Hoffpower said, Brother West, we've had this kind of attendance every morning. And I'll tell you, that's where the power is. The prayer behind the throne. and The prayer behind the pulpit. What a marvelous thing. Oh, I'm so glad to be a part of camp meeting. These are the pictorial directories that were put out last year for our, our district assembly and our 75th anniversary celebration and and they were $5 a piece last year. This year, they're at a discount. In fact, you can pick one up free in the dining hall. If you need two or three, you can have them. We have some that were left over. And uh, uh, so we want them to be, we don't want to throw them away. Many of our churches purchased them. Uh, we, we got into them a little heavier than we'd intended to financially. But uh, 
Brother Byron Lejeune, God bless his precious memory, uh, headed this up for us. Uh, J.T. Henderson and I <coughs> and our wives went to the Jonesboro Church of the Nazarene last Sunday morning to uh, look over a men in missions project there. <coughs> the parsonage, you'll be hearing more about it, is desperately need, uh, in need of repair. The foundation and slab has to be fixed before anything else can be fixed, but you'll hear more about that later. But we were at the church, and uh, they had one of these pictorial directories uh, uh, sitting on a little book stand on a table in back of the sanctuary, open to the Crowley Church. And I said, uh, Brother Hatfield, what's the meaning of this? Any special meaning? This is out here. And, oh, yes, Brother West. He said, our church is taking it a project. said, every week we pray for a different church. said, this week it's our Crowley Church. And we open our pictorial directory to the Crowley Church. And they're our special prayer project this week. I thought that was just super. Wouldn't it be great to take one of these home and every church do that across the district and take another church that week as a prayer project and you can open it up to the picture of the church and the pastor. The pastor may change, not too many changes since then, but the people are still there. Whether it's a different pastor or not and pray for them, wouldn't that be great? So they're in the dining hall. If you need one, we'd like to have you take it as... uh, a memento that uh, you'll be proud to have in years to come. Amen. Uh, Wally's going to sing for us in just a moment, and uh, of course Ginger's ill, but it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker for the service this morning, Reverend L. Wayne Quinn, our new pastor at the Huntington Park Church, and I hesitate to say new pastor there. I tell you, I like the way he and Miss Alice came on the district. Miss Alice, stand up. I, I want them to see you because I want them to know there is one pretty member of the family. And uh, but uh, when when uh, Wayne and Alice walked onto the district, they were immediately a part of the whole district, as if they'd been here all their ministry. And I just appreciated that so much. And he said, "Ah, Brother West said, you don't have to come along picking me up, thinking that I, you know, said, I'm here because this is where I believe God wants me and I'm not about to leave. You don't have to keep picking me up and wooing me. He said, I'm here because this is where God wants me. And I like that. You know, I, I had a, I can remember one couple in my life that came to my church that way one time. When they walked in that first morning, they were part of the church. I didn't have to whine them and dine them and beg them and, and, and woo them. They were part of the church that day, and I liked that. But Wayne and Alice just came in. This was where God wanted them. This was their district. This was their family. And they're just right at home, and they have such enthusiasm and and uh, such great ability. And I'm so proud that they're part of the Louisiana District Ministerial Family. And I believe that uh, God is going to use them in a special way at Huntington Park and across our district. And uh, uh, Wayne has, uh, has toured... Uh, I don't know what he's toured 64, 65 districts, but he's been on that many as a, in speaking engagements as, at conventions or district tours and has been used in a very special way. And uh, he's going to be our special speaker on our district tour in July. Uh, and uh, you'll, uh, you'll be anxious to get all of your people out to hear him. And, uh, and I asked him if he would speak for us in this morning's service this morning. And it's just a real privilege and pleasure to have him as our guest speaker in this morning's service. He'll be speaking following Wally's uh, ministry and music. Amen. Yeah. Hey. 
for the father was beyond all the failures I had made. He didn't know the all the time. And I had not obeyed the overmoon, all the scars. Thank you, Wally. I'm going to use this lapel, uh, Gene, if you will. I, I just now spotted that it's Gene back there on the controls, and and I wasn't aware that it was Gene. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said a word if I... Uh, Gene's a pro of pros. You know, I don't know how much... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much you people realize this, but this guy, Wally... This guy, Wally... This is my first time, Wally... I'll, love I'll be all right, okay? This time, Wally uh, uh, is absolutely the best in the business as far as I'm personally concerned. What have I done? Okay, I, I lost it just a second here. We're, we're, we're all right. Is it going to stay? Yeah. I think that'll hold. This man, Wally, is the best in the camp meeting business, in my opinion. And Ginger, of course, and Kip out here. He's grown up in the back seat of those cars over the years. However, don't feel sorry for Kip. Kip's all right. He's going to Mid-America next year, they tell me. And uh, I know of another young man that grew up in the back seat of an evangelist car, and his name is Jimmy Dobson. Anybody know Jimmy Dobson? Well, Jimmy grew up in the back seat of an old Chevrolet. I guess Wally, uh, you know, they do a little better than those Chevrolets. But, uh, and that's fine too. But uh, we're here on Louisiana District because we want to be. And because the Lord has, uh, has asked us to be. And without apology. It's a joy to work with uh, Ralph and Louise West. <clears throat> and uh, we've known Ralph uh, for 10, 11 years. We used to be young men, and uh, we used to be church school chairman. He of West Texas District and I of uh, Central California. And we'd meet in Kansas City about once or twice a year and, uh, and would have correspondence now and then. However, Alice and Louise didn't know each other. And uh, now they're, they're becoming good friends. And uh, so you don't have to feel sorry for us for being at uh, Shreveport Huntington Park. We're there because of design. We're there because uh, we're happy to be there. And uh, uh, the church is taking excellent care of us. And it's just, uh, it's beautiful to be in these camp meeting services. It's been a while since I've been in as good a camp meeting service as we had last night. Our district superintendent preached and I see... I see the preacher among preachers have just slipped in now. Bob, it's good to see you. And uh, this guy, Bob Hoots, is a preacher among preachers, and you know that. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed uh, the pastors and their prayer. I think, uh, Brother Summers, that was as good a prayer as I've heard for a long time yesterday morning. And I was thinking about our pastor this morning to pray. I thought, Lord, help this, help this dear buddy to, to uh, pray up to par. Man, he, uh, if anything, maybe he beat you, Summers. You're going to have to start practicing. <clears throat> then Brother Adrian prayed last night, and, 
and an excellent prayer. I've enjoyed these pastors, haven't you? Amen. I've enjoyed their prayers and uh, their messages, and, and I'll enjoy this one in a little while after it's over. But I want to tell you, our DS is doing some preaching, don't you think? Amen. I'll tell you one thing, Bob Hoots, if you out-preach the DS, you'll have to get up a little earlier, buddy. He may take your evangelistic slate. You can't ever tell. Bordelon over here, he's about to get blessed. He's been here 52 years. If you get him blessed, anybody could get blessed. <laughs> you know, I was just uh, watching that scene last night, the altar service. I told my wife. Brother Hunter over here, retired old banker, you know, old, O-L-E, not O-L-D. There's a lot of difference. But Brother Hunter came up around and helped someone pray through last night, and I whispered to Alice, I said, you know, here's a retired banker helping someone pray through at camp meeting. He's got to be a good man to do that. And then I saw others come around, Nolan and Jerry, and I thought, here, here are two professional people that have taken off a few days to come to camp meeting. And then to see you senior adults come in here for Sam's Day. I want to tell you, with a DS like this, and with a program like this, God is going to keep helping us, folks, and this could be the biggest year we've ever seen. Amen. 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 This could be the biggest year. Amen. And I'm praying for you, Brother Ralph, that God will help you to see the dream of your life. Amen. You've had ten years and it's been a little bit of a pull, but I want to tell you, it's a pull everywhere you go. Did you know it? There's no easy places that I know of. Now, if I know anything about camp meeting, and I've been going to camp meeting, Beulah Park days, back a lot of years. If I know anything about camp meeting, we come in here at night for evangelism. We come in here tonight for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to get blessed, raise Cain in Jesus, and have an altar service and see some people pray through. Isn't that what we come to church for? Camp meeting? Now, if I know anything about the daytime services, we come to get blessed and get our lamps filled and, and to get our cups full so that we can come back tonight and just take the place over. Now, is that why you came today? And, uh, and you know, the thing about it, uh, we preachers, pastors haven't had any time to prepare for this, and I, I forgot to bring my testament. And I had it laid out, and, uh, and Alice brought her uh, Bible in the back seat of the car that's worn out. This old Bible shot. She's read it I don't know how many times through. And uh, so I asked her, I said, honey, what in the world am I going to preach on next uh, in the morning? And, uh, you know, I had a lot of time to prepare. <coughs> what are you laughing about, brother? <clears throat> these DSs, they've always got these great opportunities. I want to tell you, pastors, the next time I take a church, I'd like a church. I'm tired of opportunities, aren't you? Just give me a church next time, if you don't mind, DS. But, <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, we all understand it, don't we? So uh, I asked Alice, I said, what in the world shall I preach? I know some of you said you should ask the Lord. Well... How about asking Alice and then the Lord? Some of you don't have an Alice. I do. And uh, so here's what she said. She said, just take my old Bible and turn to those scriptures I've got marked and then just keep firing. So I'm going to try a little of that. No, seriously. I'm going to try to give a little devotional here this morning that will help us spiritually and, and feed our heart, I hope. Uh, that we'll be able to come back tonight with a little more fire in the furnace and, and see a little more evangelism on top of what we saw last night. It's not a message, it's not a, ma a balanced homiletical message, and that Gene Wells preached a balanced message homiletically right down to the last letter. And did you notice yesterday morning when he got to his conclusion, he said, Wayne, how am I doing? I thought he was doing great, didn't you? Huh? It was balanced to the T, wasn't it? Now, I'm going to give you one just as unbalanced as it can get. There's nothing homiletically about this thing, Fred Summers, but it, I hope it'll be a message that'll warm your old gizzard. J.T. Moore said that we Nazarene preachers have too much gizzard. 
He said, we go around solving problems, trying to solve problems in the Lord, just one so- problem-solving situation after another, and, and, and carry the bottle here and carry the bottle there. And, and who was it, John? Did you say you had five Monday mornings some weeks? <laughs> oh, just four. Yeah, just four. I don't want to stretch it. Don't want to exaggerate. But John said he had four Monday mornings sometimes during the week. And, uh, but you know, J.T. Moore, and, and he's a brother to Mark Moore, in case you don't know J.T., great, great preacher. He, uh, he's in the Methodist Church now, but J.E. Moore is a great preacher and has been and is. But uh, he says that we preachers develop too much gizzard, solving too many tough old problems. Well, I'm tired of gizzard today, aren't you? I want to come to the king's table, and so I'm going to give a devotional this morning, feasting at the king's table. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. The only reason I've asked for this portable is I'm going to get off the stage in the closing or the conclusion. The conclusion, Gene Wells. And I'm going to get off the stage down around that altar, and that's the only reason I need uh, this portable. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Turn with me, if you will, and maybe it'd be restful if you'd stand. Would you like to stand? I'm going to read 13 verses, and I'll read fairly rapid. One day, David began wondering if any of Saul's family was still living. For he wanted to be kind to them as he had promised Prince Jonathan. I'm reading from a different version. I'm sure you've already caught that, but come along with yours. He heard about a man named Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants and summonsed him. Are you Ziba, the king asked? Yes, sir, I am, he replied. The king then asked him, Is anyone left in the, in the family of Saul? If so, I want to fulfill a sacred vow by being kind to him. Yes, Ziba replied, Jonathan's lame son is still alive. Where is he? In Lodibar, Ziba told him at the home of Melkar. So David sent for Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, and Saul's grandson. Mephibosheth arrived in great fear and greeted the king in deep humility, bowing low before him. But David said, Don't be afraid. I've asked you to come so that I can be kind to you because of my vow to your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all of the land of your grandfather Saul, and you shall live here at the palace. Mephibosheth fell to the ground before the king. Should the king show kindness to a dead dog like me, he explained. Then the king summoned Saul's uh, servant, Ziba. I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him, to produce food for his family, but he will live here with me. Ziba, who had fifteen sons and twenty servants, replied, Sir, I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly with King David, as though he were one of his very own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son, Micah. All of the household of Ziba became Mephibosheth's servants. But Mephibosheth, who was lame on both feet, moved to Jerusalem to live at the palace. You may be seated, and if you'll hold that scripture open, we're going to conclude with that and paint a verbal picture at the ending of this service in a few moments. Feasting at the king's table. For the way of an introduction this morning, you'll find that Jonathan and David, as young lieutenants in the National Army, they became bosom friends. These young men were both family men. They both had young children, so we're told. And they both were just typical family young officers in an army for their country. However, a traumatic time came in the life of Jonathan because in 1 Samuel you'll find the story written that the nurse was uh, keeping a watch over Jonathan's children 
And uh, Jonathan's boy was about five years of age, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now, that's a little bit of a hard name to remember, but you once get it, it'll be all right. Mephibosheth. And so this boy was about five, and and, uh, the nurse was keeping him. The Scripture says, if I had time, I could go back and read it for you in 1 Samuel. The Scripture says that the nurse dropped him. She became fearful because of the Philistine army. The Philistines were coming in to gobble up the crops once again, and uh, she became very nervous, and she ran evidently with this boy Mephibosheth, the grandson of King Saul, the son of Jonathan, a bosom friend of David. These young men, as I said, were bosom, bosom friends. And she dropped this boy, and he became lame on both his feet. Now, evidently, evidently, as he became lame, he evidently was crippled the rest of his life. He was not club-footed because he was not born that way. Evidently, it broken his ankles or at least some kind of difficulty. I want you to get this because it will mean much more in just a very few short minutes. I want you to hear Dad's prayer. Remember now, David was coming into his kingship, yet not king yet. God certainly had it in mind, and no doubt a few of the leaders of that nation had it in mind. And David might have had a hint in the back of his mind. But remember, Jonathan really was in line to become the next king of Israel, to follow his, uh, his father Saul. Now, Saul was developing a hatred toward any person that even looked like or even any kind of a hint that he would become the next king. Now, if you'll go back with me mentally just a little while, you'll find that as soon as this boy Mephibosheth was dropped and he became lame, and it was evident now that he had never walked properly... I can hear the prayer of Jonathan, and I want you to go back in your heart and feel the pulse of this prayer. Oh God, some way take care of my crippled boy, Mephibosheth. Lord, what in the world will happen to my boy? Can you hear him pray? Lord, what in the world will happen to my boy if for some chance I might have to give of my life literally, and be killed in battle. Lord Jesus, who will it be that will take the kingship of Israel? My father Saul has turned to be very wicked. Here's a young prince that's praying a prayer, maybe in the backwoods as we enjoy these woods. And I want to tell you, if these old trees could talk, Couldn't they tell a story or two about some old-fashioned praying through at the Louisiana camp? And so here's Jonathan out in the backwoods, if you can visualize it, praying, Oh, God, what if? What if, Lord? What if? Listen, Christians, I want to tell you, there's nothing wrong in praying what if as long as you take God's answer as He gives it to us. There's nothing wrong in saying, Lord, why me? If you'll take God's answer. There's nothing wrong in going through a bit of depression at times. Wondering if you're in the will of God. And wondering for sure if God really has exactly for you. And and if you're living exactly for Him. There's no problem, friends, as far as I'm concerned. For you and me as Christians today to ask God, why me? Provided we accept God's answer. And then we can say, why not me? Why not me? Here's Jonathan praying, and he was going through, no doubt, all kinds of reasoning with the Lord, trying to decide what might happen if if these things would happen. Now, if you'll notice back in 1 Samuel chapter 15, if you'd like to turn, I'll wait for you. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 24 And I want to read it first and then back up to verse 22 because it answers it. But you'll find here that King Saul had lost his kingdom. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 24, Saul finally admitted, Yes, 
I have disobeyed the command of God. For I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. The opinions of people. You remember that the backdrop of that scripture is that Saul had spared Agag. He had spared some of the flock. You remember that he had disobeyed God. Because in, Paul, in Saul's own words he says, I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. Now in verse 22, if you'll back up just two verses, you'll find that old Samuel, the gospel preacher, and I want to say thank God for some old Samuels still left in Louisiana. Some of you dear men that have spent your entire ministry here in this uh, state of Louisiana and in this district, Wests have come and gone and Quinns have come and gone and, and uh, Adrians have come and gone, but some of you dear men have stuck with it and stayed with it and fought the battle and, 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 and not perspired but sweat up a storm and, and just stayed with this situation until God has a special place for some of you. This old preacher was still there. Old brother Samuel was still there. And Samuel spoke up in verse 22, one clause, and I can hear him as he lowers his pitch just a little bit, as an old preacher might do. He says, obedience is far better than sacrifice. The old preacher gave good, solid advice to a young whippersnapper king that had, that had lost his leadership, he had lost his kingdom, he had destroyed himself, he had destroyed his family, and his own son, Jonathan, did not have confidence in him. And I'll read it to you in just a little bit. Couldn't this be the echo, as though Saul could hear, really the echo of Samuel's prayer? When Samuel said, obedience is far better than sacrifice. Saul's carnal mind begin to develop and grow worse from that point on. For Saul had become so carnally minded that Saul is, was literally striking out at anyone and especially striking out toward David because Saul could feel within his bones that David was the next coming king of Israel and that God had his hand upon David. Now if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 20. If, if any of you are open there. 1 Samuel chapter 20, beginning with verse uh, 30 and 31. You'll find here that this is exactly what's happening. Saul said, 1 Samuel 20, verse 30. Saul said, Do you think that I don't know that you want this son of a nobody to be the king of your place? Now, watch the, next, watch the next clause. He said, this son of a nobody will shame yourself and your mother. He's referring to David. Now go and get him so I personally can destroy him. These are the, these are the words of King Saul in reference to David. In verse 32, here you'll find a friendship begins... To uh, show itself here, Jonathan demanded, Why, Dad, should this man be put to death? I'm reading from a different rendering. You can see it. Now in verse 42, verse 42, At last, Jonathan said to David, Cheer up. For we have entrusted each other and each other's children to God's hand forever. Here's a friendship that I want to draw for you. Here is Jonathan and David, as I said, young lieutenants together in the National Army, literally talking about what if one of them would be destroyed in army or in battle. And here's Jonathan saying to David, he said, David, don't you be worried. I refuse to participate with my father, Saul. I refuse to be the forerunner of your death. He said, after all, David, we've entrusted each other and each other's children in God's hands. Now let's go just a little further. 
you'll find that as this scene begins to unlock, you'll find that, you'll find that in God's focus of time, you'll see that the hand of God is beginning to move on this scene and this scripture lesson in 2 Samuel chapter 9. This is all going to make sense if you'll just hang on for the big picture. You see, God was doing His work for the future. Can you see it? God was doing His work for the future. How many of you know in the book of Revelation where God speaks of the bottled up prayers of His saints to be answered at a later time? Do you know that to be true? That's in the book of Revelation. You, you all, you're aware of that, aren't you? Now, what happens? I'll tell you what happens. Brother Wes, and to Alice and me, and to you and Louise, you are to pray for that grandson, age four. You're to pray up a storm every day. Oh, God, keep your hand upon that baby. Don't let him be destroyed by the enemy. Don't let him get on drugs. Don't let him have a car accident. Don't let him go astray. Keeping them in the center of your will. And that's the way I'm to pray for our Brian. We've got one just exactly his age. And this is the way we're to pray every day, Louise and Alice, because these are our grandchildren, and we probably won't live long enough to see them into a strong, mature, 30 or 35-year-old age. And so we're to build up a hedge, and we're to pray a prayer ahead of time. And then you know what will happen? Some gospel preacher called a Nazarene pastor of First Church Pumpkin Center will come along and win that young kid to Jesus, about 18 or 19, and then some preacher from Pumpkin Center will marry him at the altar when he's about 24, and then some preacher along from Pumpkin Center will dedicate the children. And all of a sudden, someone says, Isn't it great that pastor of First Church, Pumpkin Center, led my children to Jesus and led West's grandbaby and, and Quinn's grandbaby? Listen, I want to tell you, folks, Maybe that preacher participated, but I'm going to tell you this. Old grandpa's and grandma's prayers were bottled up and answered at a later date. Amen. Praise God. I want to tell you, we have some church members that are second to none at Huntington Park. And I'll guarantee you it's not very many of my prayers that have done it yet. But it's some of your prayers that have been invested into your local church, whatever your church may be and in this local camp meeting. I'm talking about bottled up prayers. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense yet. You hang on. When we close this scene here today, it's going to make every ounce of sense. Bottled up prayers. You see, if we'll have the judgment as we go along to do what God wants us to do, then we can be the instrument of God answering grandparents' prayers parents' prayers, neighbors' prayers, and as this little lady said, she planned to keep on praying to the very last breath for her grandkids. That's bottled up prayers, ma'am. That's bottled up prayers. And some of us, if we're still around, we're going to help the Lord answer those prayers just for you. And you're going to be already gone over there just shouting up a storm and walking on streets of gold and not messing with those Catholics playing bingo. See, I heard your testimony yesterday. I heard your testimony. You see what happens? This is called bottled up prayers being answered later. I want to tell you one story. I was on the plane. Alice and I was on the plane. No, she wasn't with me. I went to New Guinea alone. She said, New Guinea's too tough for me. And it was pretty tough. Anyway, we took a group of working witness team to New Guinea and built a tabernacle like this. It wasn't quite as nice as this, but we built one that seats 800. Our local church gave it to the New Guinea district. And so we came back, we came back and coming out of Brisbane, uh, Australia, uh, we got on a plane with a man and his wife and a very distinguished looking gentleman, he and his wife, and uh, he was very stiff and starchy, cool, just a bit. She was a very friendly, wholesome, happy type of a middle-aged lady, middle-aged to older. And so on the plane, I, I was dead tired, and I told the Lord that I was tired and I was going to go to bed on the plane. 
uh, bed was four extra seats. You know the feeling, don't you, Wally? And so we just buckled in the middle and got on four extra seats and stretched out. The Lord pushed me in the ribs and he said, hey, dummy, get up out of this seat. I don't know that he said it exactly like that, but I understood it. He said, get up out of this seat and win this man to Jesus. I said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want. Now, Gene Wells, I didn't have a polished rock. I don't know how in the world I ever won him without a rock. See, Gene Wells and I and several of us, the DS, we carry these polished rocks. And uh, we're not going to take time to bore you with that now. But I uh, leaned across the seat to this man and I said, Sir, I'm a Christian. Never told him I was a preacher. I'm a Christian. Do you know Jesus is your personal Savior? He said, No, sir, I don't. Do you mind if I come back there and talk to you? He said, I'd like for you to. His wife got up and moved across the aisle. Not that she wasn't interested, but she was just a smart little Christian woman. I found out later, and she just saw that I'll get out of the way and let this old boy work on my husband. Pretty sharp girl. So she gave me a seat right next to him, and I began to ask him why he wasn't saved. Listen to this. He said, I'm not saved because my parents were Mennonites, and they wouldn't let me read the funnies on Sunday. We couldn't play softball on Sunday. We couldn't shoot a basket. If we didn't go to church with a white shirt and tie, it just wasn't on, it wasn't Sunday. And he said, I've just grown so hateful and resentful over the years. I don't want anything to do with religion. I said, sir, you look like you're a smart man, but you're talking like you're dumb. Well, I got his attention. He said, okay, okay. Tell you the truth, I think you're right. I said, sir, how long has your dad and mom been dead? He said, eight years. I said, how old are you? He said, 68. I said, you mean to tell me you're cursing God and the Mennonite church and your daddy and mama that's been dead eight years saying that they were so radical that you didn't want anything to do with it? I'm talking about bottled up prayers, friends. Hang on. But he said, I don't know how to pray. I said, would you follow me? He said, I will. Dear Jesus... Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. And we prayed the sinner's prayer. And he looked up and he said, Mr. Quinn, he said, I don't know exactly what happened, but he said, something has happened within my heart and I've never had this experience. And he said, all of a sudden, I've forgiven my dad and mom. Now listen to this. He turned to his wife and he said, Mama, I'll go to the Baptist church with you now. Mama, I'll go to the Baptist church with you now. Listen to this. And she answered back and she said, Daddy, now do you know why we missed our plane in Brisbane? Am I talking about answered prayers or not? Bottled up, answered prayer. Now you say, it was Quinn that came along. Baloney. It was daddy and mom that lived for Jesus Christ. And maybe they were radical. Maybe they were radical. But they were probably doing exactly what they thought God wanted them to do. And they took maybe too much of a rabid stand. But at least their prayers were answered by someone that came along on that old plane and led him to Jesus. Now I want to change the scene. Saul has taken his life now. Saul has taken his own life. Jonathan has been killed in battle. Jonathan's dead. Who's left? The other young lieutenant by the name of David. He's just been appointed king of Israel. Now, where in the world is that boy? Where is he? Mephibosheth, where is he? I want, to just, uh, I want to just meddle now for a little while. Surely God has forgotten him. Surely. Surely he must be full of resentment. The scripture says he is in Lodibar and the rendering of that means short pastures. How many of you people pasture at short pastures? None of you? Huh. Must be good churches down here, brother. 
Short pastures. Lodibar. Here's a young boy. Where is he? Well, he's off out here, let's say, full of resentment. Full of anger. Full of depression. After all, he's the grandson of King Saul and a son of Jonathan. When you really get down to where the rubber meets the road, this boy, Mephibosheth, really could have been in line to become the next king. But he's crippled. He's lame. He can't walk. He's hidden out of sight. Scholars say he's about in his mid-twenties, maybe 28. Because they say manhood, you know, wasn't really until about 35 in that day. So some scholars think that he's just under 30, somewhere around 28 or 9. This young man could have been full of resentment, hatred, depression, strife, disappointment. All kinds of fussing could be going on in his mind because he stuck out away from everything that really mattered in Lodibar. Forgotten. You know, he could act like a board member that fails to get reelected. Hey, man, this is camp meeting, Brother Hoots. Could act like some layman all puffed up. These dear people don't like me well enough to put me on the board. I'll go somewhere else. Well, tootly do. See you later. Now you laugh. Now you layman can laugh. Or it could be like a pastor who failed to get a proper vote and went home all crushed. Come on, preachers. Don't muddle through. If you happen to get a lousy vote and not everybody wanted you to stay, I'll tell you one thing. You could be like Bud Robinson, and he said, he said, I may die with starvation, but I'm going to let on like it's measles. Old Buddy Robinson once said, and I love Buddy Robinson's stories. I like, I repeat him a lot, quote him a lot. He said, everybody ought to want to go to heaven if nothing else for the trip. Right. Amen. I know some laymen that are pouting and puffed up because of different circumstances that didn't go their way. And I know some pastors that get all pushed out of shape and crushed down and muddled through. Because they're in some place called Lodibar. Anybody here? Ladies and gentlemen, if you are in Lodibar this morning, don't you wimp and whine, but get on the praise line. Boy, I like that chorus. Get on the praise line and let's take the advice of Corey Ten Boom and find out that there's a bridge called praise. I've been in Louisiana. You know, we used to live here 29 years ago. We were with the Pilgrims, and we were having camp meeting out here at uh, Tioga or someplace else, or Sims. While the Nazarenes, you know, Nazarenes was a bad word to us back 29 years ago. We thought you folks, we, we, we're pretty sure that you were going to go to heaven if you didn't go past. Some of you will get that in a minute. We don't have that same worry anymore, do we, Doc? God help us to warm up a little bit and get a little more of what you guys used to have 35 years ago. Isn't that right? God give us a little more of what we used to have 35 years ago. Praise God. But keep it air conditioned. Don't whip and whine around as laymen or preachers if you're having a loady bar. Get on the praise line. I'm ready to close. Here we are. Can you feel the wrestling of the mulberry bushes just a little bit in this scripture? Can you feel that, that, that God is just about ready to answer prayer? Amen. God is about ready to answer prayer. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and God's going to answer 
through a king. And David said, Is there yet any that's left in the house of Saul that I may show kindness unto Jonathan, unto him for Jonathan's sake? And he called the head servant Ziba. Scholars tell us that that's a black man. And he called the head servant Ziba. And I believe that Ziba was six foot three inches tall and weighed 250 pounds. And I believe he knew how to wear the uniform of royalty. And I can see that black man, whether he was black or not, I could care less. But I could see Ziba as he stands erect before the young King David. And he says to David, yes, there is one, and his name is Mephibosheth. He's the lame son of Jonathan. And David said, he's the boy that was dropped by the nurse when the Philistines came. And he's the young man that Jonathan used to pray in secret prayer out there on the hillside in the army. Oh God, take care of my kid. He said, where is this boy? And Ziba said, he's yonder in the house of Melchar, the son of Amal in Lodibar. That's like saying he's at 524 Walnut Street in Pineville, Louisiana, and he's having it tough, Brother King. He's having it tough. Now the king said, the king said, I want you to bring him. And I want you to bring him to me. I want him to feast in my court as long as he lives. Now I jotted down as to what he's going to eat. The daily ration for the palace. Here it is. You can write it down if you like. 195 bushels of flour. That'd make a lot of uh, biscuits. And 390 bushels of meal. There's your cornbread. Ten fat oxen out of the feed pens. There's your best steaks. Kip, that isn't bad, is it? And then 20 oxen out of the pasture. There's your hamburger meat and roast. And a hundred sheep. There's your leg of lamb. That isn't bad, is it? A hundred sheep. Plus, the Scripture says... Plus deer and plump fowl. King David. Ziba, do you know exactly how to find 524 Walnut Street, Pineville, Louisiana? He said, yes sir, I do. He said, that's down at the house of Melchar, the son of Amel in Lodibar. Now that's easy, isn't it? Fine. So he goes. The scripture says, I want you to go yonder and fetch him unto me. Talked like a Louisiana, didn't it? Read the King James, that's what it says. I want you to go yonder and fetch him and bring him unto me. Now go with me. He goes down to the house of Melchar, the son of Amel in Lodibar, and he knocks at the door. A man about 28 years of age comes hobbling to the door, taking his way. Here he is. He's crippled all of his life. The scripture said he's lame on both feet. And, and Mephibosheth peeks through the door. He was so poor he didn't have one of those little peepholes. So he peeks through the door, but I think he had the chain on it. Can you see it? But say, Mephibosheth recognized, he recognized royalty, he recognized that uniform that Ziba was wearing. And Ziba said, Sir, are you the grandson of King Saul? Yes. Are you the son of Jonathan? Yes. Then would your name happen to be Mephibosheth? He said, Yes. And Ziba said, Sir, Come and go with me. You've been invited to come to the king's house the rest of your life. Amen. That, Amen. Beats a, that beats a rest home all to pieces. Amen. That beats the district parsonage. That beats the local parsonage. That beats that pad that you live at. Doesn't it? I want you to come and feast at the king's table as long as you live. And old, old Mephibosheth said, wait a minute. Let me get my American tourist story. My Samsonite. Wally, he didn't have nothing more than a burlap sack. Yeah. Right. 
What do we call them down here? Huh? What? A toe sack. He had a toe sack. Do you understand that? I'm not preaching over your head. So he took his toe sack. What did he do? He put his toothbrush. He put his comb. He put his... I don't know what all. I don't think he had long pajamas. He put his little belongings in there and he said to Ziba, he said, I'm ready to go to the king's house. You know what he said? He said, I remember daddy prayed. I remember my daddy prayed. Oh God, take care of me. He said, I, I know I've been crippled all my life, but daddy prayed. Daddy prayed a long time that God will take care of me. And he said, Daddy, when Daddy got killed in the army, he said, I wondered if they'd forgotten me. Lord, forgive me for being bitter. Forgive me for having depression. Forgive me for having anger. Forgive me, Lord, for having a bad attitude. The King has come through. David has come through now, Lord. Can you see that picture? Oh, forgive me, Lord, for feeling like I've got an assignment too small. Truth of it is, I've got an assignment too big. Anybody here? Anybody here? And so he said, Ziba, I'm ready to go to the king's house. Now, it's supper time. The old king walks in, and he sits down at the head of the table. His servants start to gather in fast, and David said, Wait a minute, gentlemen. We have an invited guest, and he hasn't arrived yet. The front door is open. And old Ziba, this great big, strong, strapping servant, six foot three. You say, I don't think you're that big. Well, then you paint him however big you want to. I don't know how big he was either. But he looked like a big one to me. And Ziba was hanging on to his arm. And he had that little old bag of nothings. And he was just a hobbling. And they were coming down the long corridor, making their way to the king's table. And when they got to the king's table, and here's the message. Here's the message. David said, ladies and gentlemen, we have an invited guest. He'll sit at my table as long as he lives. He's 28 years of age now, gentlemen. And if he lives to be 109, he is permitted to sit at this table as long as he lives. David said, Mephibosheth, I want you to pull up a chair. And when you do, I want you to put your feet beneath the king's table and hide your crippleness and we'll never see your crippleness again. Amen. You know what our problem is in local churches and districts and everywhere we go? Our problem is that we're too far away from the table. You know, if any of you are sitting there criticizing Wally and Ginger, you're just too far away from the table. If you'll get up close enough to the table, you'll find these are some of the best people in the world. If you're sitting here criticizing the DS, you're just too far away from the table. We pastors, if we're sitting here criticizing one another and church members and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ladies and gentlemen, we're too far away from the table. There's something about it when I come to the table with my crippleness, my big nose, my, my failures, my, my crippled feet, all the rest of it. When I put my feet underneath the king's table, all you can see is from here up and you don't see my crippleness. And you know I can overlook your weaknesses and you can overlook mine. And the first thing you know, we all love one another together. We're all pulling for one another only because we're feasting. At the king's table. Thank you, Brother West. Praise God. Thank you. I believe God had his hand in that. I believe he had his hand in it for Ralph West this morning. It encourages me. I knew it, that God had our prayers bottled up. Sometimes we forget it, don't we? And all oh, to get up close to the table. 
feast at the king's table. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Quinn. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence today, and thank you for this message, and thank you for this messenger. <laughs> we pray that you'll bless the message to our hearts. May we feast on it, not only today, but down through the weeks to come. Be with us throughout this day, guide and direct in all the activities. Bless our SAM members, how we love them. We lift them up. We know, dear Lord, this this is a big day for them, and some of them have come with physical difficulties, but they've come anyway. Wanted to be in camp meeting. Touch them today. We pray that you'll pull back the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing upon them that will be far beyond uh, their fondest imaginations, their fondest expectations. Bless them beyond their imagination today. Amen. Give them more than they expected. Make it a grand and glorious day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God.